The Bible reading for this morning is from Nehemiah chapter 5, starting with verse 14, which you can find on page 686 in the Pew Bible in front of you if you'd like to follow along. Moreover, from the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, until his 32nd year, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the food allotted to the governor. But the earlier governors, those preceding me, placed a heavy burden on the people and took 40 shekels of silver from them in addition to food and wine. Their assistants also lorded it over the people. But out of reverence for God, I did not act like that. Instead, I devoted myself to the work on this wall. All my men were assembled there for the work. We did not acquire any land. Furthermore, 150 Jews and officials ate at my table, as well as those who came to us from the surrounding nations. Each day, one ox, six choice sheep, and some poultry were prepared for me, and every 10 days, an abundant supply of wine of all kinds. In spite of all this, I never demanded the food allotted to the governor because the demands were heavy on the people. Remember me with favor, my God, for all I have done for these people. Thanks, Sharon. Good morning, High Point Church. How are you? Good. It's good to see you all this morning. Looks like maybe even since last week, some people heard, uh, heeded Nick's uh, kind of admonition to maybe move towards the second service. Amen. We've been having 550 or so people come to first service and about 300 in the second and it looks like maybe we've got a little evened out service, so that's, we're excited about that. Um, Pastor Nick, you heard earlier in the prayer, is uh, in India uh, with Manohar and with his uh, daughter, Rachel. Uh, these next couple of weeks, we're going to continue in Nehemiah. Uh, I'll be preaching this week, and then you'll have Pastor Mike uh, next week. In this series in Nehemiah, uh, in chapter 1, we started with Nehemiah's burden. Uh, Jerusalem is burned down. Its people are hassled. Uh, in cha- late in chapter 1, he rallies the people to begin the work. Uh, early in chapter 2, we see that he, is, uh, he runs into um, uh, at opposition. Uh, the Ammonites, the Sumerians, surrounding nations are not interested in seeing Jerusalem restored and its people encouraged, so they're constantly uh, trying to thwart the work, even by violence if they have to. And that story goes on in chapters 3 and chapters 4, and Nehemiah stands strong. He works and he prays, and the work continues. Then he gets to chapter 5, and then he runs into another problem. This problem is more of an interior problem. And the interior problem is this, is that the the king of Babylon is, is taxing the people in Jerusalem, and the people are unable to pay the taxes. And so the, the city is full of very poor or, or moderate and then extremely wealthy. And so the poor have to go to the rich on bad terms in order to get cash, in order to pay these taxes, even so much so that they have to sell their own children. Can you imagine this? I could, could I imagine taking my oldest son, Jason, and saying, Jason, I can't pay the federal taxes, so you got to go work for the government until we can pay. Amen? That's the dire situation that they find themselves in. And it, even in this particular case, those who, who they went to, their fellow Jews, were charging them high interest, which was against their laws. And so Nehemiah combats this. He tells the rich people, give them back their land, free their children, Uh, lend without interest and give. And then that brings us to this point in the the message. Um, Nehemiah is talking about uh, leadership. Not everybody considers themselves to be a leader. Um, You might uh, take the local church you might be a greeter at the front door, or you might volunteer in children's ministry, or you might work in some reception area, and, and you may not see the significance of your leadership role. 
But it's, it's, it is true, though, that you are a leader. A leader is a person who guides someone to an intended um, uh, end. And um, And even if you recognize, you see yourself as not having a particularly significant leadership role, uh, it's really important that you learn the difference between a good leader and a bad leader. For instance, earlier Ashlyn talked about that there, we're looking for three uh, men to become elders on our church. And the question you should be thinking about is, what kind of people ought to be leading in the church, right? So even if you don't necessarily see yourself as a leader, um, you, we oftentimes have the responsibility of choosing a leader, whether it be in our church or maybe in a spouse. If you're a young man and you are looking to marry a young woman, you need to be looking for an effective leader because she uh, will partner with you and you will um, start a family, maybe raise children together. And so these leadership roles are, can be very substantial. It's really important. And as I mentioned before, in Nehemiah's time, leadership was really poor. The governors were t uh, taking full advantage of people, uh, charging taxes that the people couldn't afford. The nobles and the officers were charging high interest. And so there wasn't a sense of serving for the common good. There was a sense of taking advantage where, where they could take advantage. In the midst of this, we see uncommon leadership displayed by Nehemiah. Um, uncommon leadership is the subject of this morning's message. And Nehemiah shows us that uncommon leadership is God-honoring and sacrificial. Um, godly leadership is God-honoring and sacrificial. That's what we're going to see in our text. And I've got uh, four different points that I'm going to make on this. Two of the points have to do with how we honor God in our leadership, and two of the points have to do with our sacrificial service. So let's jump in. This point, embracing the weightiness of serving God changes our perspective on leadership. Here we're talking about God honoring. Nehemiah 5, 14 and 15. Moreover, uh, continuing from where he just took on the corruption of the nobles and the officials, he's continuing on that vein. Moreover, from the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when I was appointed to be their governor in the land, until his 32nd year, 12 years in total, neither I nor my brothers ate the food that was allotted to the governor. But the earlier governors, those preceding me, placed a heavy burden on the people and took 40 shekels of silver from them, in addition to food and wine. Their assistants also lorded it over the people. But out of reverence for God, I did not act like that. Out of, it was the reverence for God. It was the, a deep abiding faith in God that caused him um, to want to serve God humbly and serve others lovingly. Now, who is this God that we should fear him? Who is this God that we should reverence him? I like the way uh, Paul talks about this in his letter to 1 Timothy as he closes it. He refers to God this way. He says, God, the blessed and the only ruler, that is the ultimate ruler. And he says it a couple different ways. He's the king of kings, right? There may be a king um, in Great Britain and there are leaders all over the world, but this is the king above every king. This is the Lord or master above every master, uh, who alone is immortal. He is the only one who has existed from eternity past to the current to eternity future. No other person can make that claim. Uh, he, he uh, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, that is, no human being can see God in his heavenly splendor. No human being has ever seen him in his heavenly splendor. Who lives in an approachable light, who no one has seen or can see. To him be honor and might forever. Amen. And the thing is that when you get a proper understanding of how majestic, um, how gracious, how truthful, how merciful, uh, how righteous this God is, 
It changes the way you think about leadership. And, and, and the impact it has on uh, Jeremiah, excuse me, uh, on Nehemiah, and the impact it should have on us is this. The fear of the Lord is the uncommon leader's uh, superpower. Nehemiah has this, uh, two attributes that are, are essential to his great success. And as, I've, as I have watched godly leaders um, succeed in doing God's work and building his kingdom, I see these attributes over and over again. Um, the first is um, they move their heart Godward. I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. They move their heart Godward, and at the same time, they move their, their feet forward in terms of the mission. They know what they're supposed to do, and they, they ask God for the strength in order to accomplish it. And Nehemiah is uh, an expert at this on 684, is a, gr a great example. It's when he's running into conflicts from the people that he displays this awesome attribute. And so the people are ridiculing him and the workers. And in verse four of, of chapter four, he says this. He says, hear us, God, for we are despised by the enemy nations. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in the land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. And you will remember that this whole idea to rebuild the temple and rebuild the people was God's idea that God gave to Nehemiah. And so he knew full well that he was on God's mission. And so he's on God's mission. The opposition is here and he says to God, these are your enemies. And as much as I'm serving you, these are your enemies as well as mine. So he prays while he works, and then verse six says, so we rebuilt the wall till all it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. Verse seven, but the opposition continued, but when Sambalat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's wall had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it, but what did he do? He prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. And so what he does in all of his striving is he prays and works together. This is the leader's superpower. If you ever see an effective, godly Christian leader, mark this, these attributes. They will pray and they will work. They work as if everything depended on them and they pray as if everything depended on God. And I, I, got, I, got, I wanna say this, that High Point is blessed um, with uh, our, an executive pastor and a senior pastor who modeled this like perfectly. Um, and there are certain kinds of people like who, um, what's the word you would say? Well, we would say this isn't a good Christian word. We would say they were, they're suck-ups. They're always sucking up to the leaders, right? That ain't, that's not me. That's not me. But I will give credit where credit's due. And in these two gentlemen, Pastor Nick and Pastor Mike, you have folks that see God's vision for where the church needs to go, uh, work hard on it on a daily basis, despite disappointment and, and an opposition, um, d despite personal things going on in, in their lives that all fathers and husbands have to deal with, and with tremendous faith and lead us in prayer in order to accomplish God's goals. And this is what successful leadership looks like. Uncommon leadership is God honoring and sacrificial. This second point, our focus is on the impact we can make. This is more of sacrificial. First point and the fourth point were God honoring. The second and the third points speak to sacrificial. Our focus is on the impact we can make, not the wealth we can acquire. Nehemiah 5, 15 and 16. But the earlier governors, those preceding me, they placed a heavy burden on the people and they took 40 she shekels of silver from them in addition to food and wine. The commentators believe that this was like the daily tax 
and this would have been quite substantial, 40 shekels of silver in addition to daily food and wine. But out of reverence for God, out of respect for God and what he wanted to accomplish, I did not act like that. Instead, I devoted myself to the work on this wall. All my men were assembled here, there for the work, and we did not acquire any land. Uh, so within common leadership um, that we see so often, that I saw so often in business, to, to be quite honest with you, common leadership, the leaders lead to make profit and to be comfortable. But in un uncommon leadership, the leaders lead to honor God and to serve the common good. The focus needs to be for the uncommon leader on the impact that they can make and on the glory that God can receive. So what was the impact that Nehemiah's work accomplished? Nehemiah 6, 15 and 16 says this, the wall was completed in 52 days. Now, the whole, I've never been to Jerusalem, but imagine Madison, Wisconsin, and having a defense wall across the whole city that was torn down with rubble, its gates of wood burned with fire, and the whole project, even today with modern technology, done in 52 days. Are you kidding me? We can't barely get a road completed in three years. Come on with me. <laughs> And they built around the whole city of Jerusalem. They restored the wall, moving out the rubble, rebuilding it brick by brick in 52 days, working night and day. They ha you can't do that unless you have a laser focus on the work, on the mission that needs to be done. And what was the result of that? Now, when all of our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations became afraid and lost their self-confidence. Why? because they realized this work had been done with the help of our God. And so the, the impact is that Nehemiah is beginning to not only physically restore the physical defenses of the city, this is the first step where he'll then begin to restore the, the religious and the faith practices of the people so that their hearts towards God will be clearly directed so that they can stand strong. And so we see this work being done. Um, one of the things I have noticed in terms of the impact in ministry that is un, underappreciated, and I also saw this in the impact as business, is the impact of administrative people in the organization. These are people whose role is to support the leaders. I'll tell you this, here at High Point, nothing, nothing important gets accomplished without successful administrative leadership. Uh, th these are the people that are project managers. They rally all the troops. These are the people that are pointing us ahead. They say, hey, we've got the sexuality conference coming in six months. Has anybody hired the speakers? Uh, we've got a, a, a sermon series coming. Have, ha have you begun to start preparing for the sermon series? They're the folks that just rally folks together. And when it comes to engage and equip, if you've come to engage and equip, and if you've enjoyed it, you, you owe a, a debt of gratitude to about five or six administrative leaders at our church who coordinate all the elders and ministers to be able to get together to do that. You come and you see Pastor Nick or Mike or me or Aaron teach, but behind that is a, a whole ocean of activities that makes that possible. And so there's this impact that administrative people come and the best administrative people are the ones that actually look forward. They anticipate needs. And so they keep the ministry moving forward. They have impact. They allow High Point Church, they allow your organizations where you work to be able to multiply the work that they do. They allow us to be able to serve each other well. Um, they have impact that honors God. Third, our generosity is rooted in a genuine love for people. Nehemiah 5 and 17. Furthermore, 150 Jews and officials ate at my table. These, this would have been the official governor's capacity of things. But look at what occurs next. As well as those 
who came to us from the surrounding nations, i.e. needy people, a Jewish people who were in the surrounding nations that didn't have resources, came to eat at his table. Now, each day, one ox, six choice sheep, and some poultry were prepared for me. And every 10 days, an abundant supply of wine of all kinds. In spite of all of this, I never demanded the food allotted to the governor. Look at what he's saying is, all of this was supplied by my own hand. So either King Artaxerxes sent him to Jerusalem with these supplies, or as his work as the, the, uh, the wine uh, the keeper, uh, the, uh, the person who supplied wine to the king, as his work, he earned so much that he was able to have an excess. And so all that is supplied for the 150 to eight at his table every day, as well as the poor that came, came out of his own pocket. One of the things that we need to notice about love is that it notices the condition of the people. Note in Nehemiah, he said, the reason I didn't do these taxes of food and drink wasn't because I didn't have the authority to do it, it was that the people couldn't pay it. So he looks upon the people and leads in a way that um, takes into consideration where they are at a given point in time. So the best leaders know the condition of the people that they are, are, are leading. Um, so my youngest brother uh, passed here a few weeks back. And um, He left his inheritance in, in two parts. Uh, one was to my mom, and the other part uh, is to me. And I have, I have two other living siblings. My older sister died in 2017, and so my youngest sister, who has a teenage son, and my older brother, who's a bachelor, are at home. My older brother's totally disabled. So God was impressing upon me when we had this meeting at my mom's house on Saturday to talk about how we need to steward these assets for the good of the family. God was impressing on me heavily, Lloyd, you got enough. I'm gonna take care of you. Make sure the assets are stewarded for the people that need it. And so, what God prompts the uncommon leader is to not worry about himself because God has promised that when we pursue righteousness, he's going to take care of all of our needs so that we can fully devote ourselves to the needs of other people. That's uncommon leadership. That's the kind of leadership that we want to model. And love relieves burdens. It doesn't add burdens on. And so even though the previous governors and the nobles and officials saw that the city was burned down and the people were going broke, they kept adding burdens on because they could. And that's a sign of corruption. But good leadership, godly leadership, humble leadership, sees struggling people and gets involved in the work and actually relieves burdens, takes the burdens off the troubled people, right? These are the kinds of leaders that we want to be. So we want to be the kinds of leaders that display love as an action. Uh, we want to get deeply involved in people's lives. Um, right now at High Point, we are asking our elders and deacons to do things that we haven't asked them to do in the past. We're asking each of them, each deacon couple or deacon and each elder, we're asking them to take on six families, six family units, could be singles, could be, could be uh, extended families. And we're saying, um, connect with them, love them, see what their needs are, and serve them. Um, this weekend even, while I was in Chicago, uh, working with my brothers and sisters and, and looking in on my 90-year-old mom, um, 
a, a very, an elder in our church who was just recently assigned a person had to spend a large part of the weekend in the hospital with one of our members. Love as an action. This is the kind of thing that distinguishes us from um, the world. The fact that be, through Jesus' power, through his death, burial, and resurrection, he has called us to be sacrificial like he is and to pour our lives into each other's lives. So love is an action for us. It's, not, it's more than just a feeling, though it does include feelings. It motivates us to move towards our brother or sister, whether we know them or not, and assist with the kind of assistance that they need. Fourth, fourth, and this one has to do with also being God-honoring. Fourth, our hopeful reward is directed towards God alone. Nehemiah says this at the end of this paragraph. He says this, he says, Remember me with, with favor, my God, for all I have done for these people. Now, the mistake that I have made over my leadership career is that I have wanted people to recognize what a wonderful job I've been doing for the team, right? I want my bosses to recognize come pay time, come, uh, come time for the annual review, I want the 15% raise, not the 2% one, right? And, I, and at church, if I'm not careful, um, when I do my ministry, I, I look for approval of the crowds, of the, of the congregation, to, to love uh, what I do. But, but that's not what the uncommon leader does. The uncommon leader looks to, to God for their approval only, first and foremost. Now, now the, the funny thing about this is, if you look at Nehemiah and you read his readings, you will see that he really does point out in his own leadership where he's doing things that are extraordinary in comparison to his peers. And, and even in this prayer, one might think, man, this guy must be a serious egomaniac. How is it that he's asking for a special blessing as he's something? But what I want you to know, every Christian, is that it's okay to ask God to bless you. It's okay because it's what God wants you to do. In Matthew 7, the, the text says, ask, seek, knock, because God's desire is to bless you. It's okay to look to God for the things that you want and, to need, and, and that you need. In fact, it, it's God who delights to give his children good things. As a dad with my boys in my home, if they wanted something, I didn't want them going to the neighbor asking for new pants or new clothes. Come on, me. I didn't want them going to the neighbor or to their teacher at school asking for stuff when I was available to, 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 to hear and to provide. And it's the same with God. Our God delights in giving us good gifts. And we've got to recognize that, that it's okay to ask God for what you need. And it's even okay to ask him for crazy stuff. He just won't answer it. He'll just laugh at you. <laughs> he won't get upset. It's okay to ask God. And the other thing that's really important is this Psalm 150. And I will take a second to, to pull this out. Uh, asking is really a sign of humility. Did you know that? Psalm 50 says it this way. Psalm 50 and 14, God is saying, sacrifice thank offerings. Give thanks to God. Do what you say you're going to do. Fulfill your vows to the, high, to the Most High. And then he says this in verse 15. And call on me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and you will honor me. Amen. So the relationship that God wants to have with us is a relationship of dependency. We, work, we recognize our frailties, we recognize his unlimited resources, and we recognize his eternal goodness. He wants us to ask, and then he wants us to respond by giving him glory. Amen? And I want to close with, with this. The uncommon leader. Jesus is the uncommon leader. 
He is both God honoring and sacrificial. In John chapter 17, as Jesus is about to go to his final act of sacrifice for all men to kind, dying on the cross to, um, to redeem all of us from our sins, uh, his, his last prayer is very insightful. He says this in John 17, after Jesus had, uh, uh, had said this, he looked towards heaven and he prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might, Jesus might give eternal life to all those you had given him. Now, this is eternal life that you know that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Jesus saw his ultimate fulfillment in the preaching and the healing and the leading of people and then ultimately in the dying in the rising from the dead, he saw that whole work as being, uh, giving honor and glory to the Father. And so he, like us, invests his leadership in giving honor to God. And then in Matthew, uh, in Luke chapter 10, Mark chapter 10, verses 42 through 45, um, uh, Jesus is telling his disciples about his impending death, burial, and resurrection for the redemption of the world. And they, at first they don't want to hear it. Then they get the sense that Jesus is going to inherit his kingdom, and they want their own um, power and authority in his kingdom. So they come to him. Two of them come to him and ask to be on his right and his left in their kingdom. And Jesus' answers to, to them is insightful to, to all of us. He tells them that, yes, indeed, um, that is how the world leads. It takes advantage of people. It exercises power, but not among you. He says, the one who is going to be the greatest is going to be the servant of all. And then he says this of himself. He says, even the Son of Man has not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. And so if we want to become uncommon leaders in our workplaces, in our homes, we need to accept Jesus' call into, into him. We need to follow the leader, as it were, into the kingdom of God, coming to him in repentance and faith. And then we want to follow in his footsteps. Once we receive um, forgiveness, once we receive his spirit, once we can understand and appropriate his word, we want to then walk in um, sacrifice and walk in a God-honoring and sacrificial way, which produces flourishing for our neighborhoods and our societies. We're about to elect a new president in the United States or, or reaffirm the old president. Wouldn't it be good if all of our, com all of our candidates were uncommon leaders? Uh, honoring God for being the creator and the sustainer of the universe and really wanting to sacrifice for the good of the people, wouldn't it? What kind of um, flourishing, what, what kind of excitement it would be when we go to the polls if that was our selection? So let us be those kind of people. Let us be those kind of candidates. Let us be those kind of teachers, those kind of parents those kind of pastors, because when we are the kingdom of God, we bring the kingdom of God into, into our communities. Worship team, you can come forward. Let us pray. Lord, this uh, subject that Nehemiah uh, brings forward of how to, uh, how to lead rightly is a really timely subject for us. 
Uh, it's so easy, Father, for us to be uh, self-serving. We don't, it doesn't take any effort on our part uh, to only look out for our own income, only look out for our own comfort, uh, only look out for our own image and reputation. But Father, you've come that we would have real a life and real impact. You've come to show us that the, the better way of life is to love and to serve people. That, but through love and through service is where we encounter our, our, our fullest joy. And through love and through service is how we make our world more like we would, would want it to be, more like the kingdom of God. Is where we display what Christ-like leadership would look like is when we walk according to your perfect pattern. So we thank you for the instruction that you've given us in Nehemiah. We recognize the areas where you've, you have placed us as the leader, whether it be something we consider in our own hearts to be large or great or small. Lord, we pledge that we're going to take it seriously and serve in an uncommon fashion. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.